From New York, this is Democracy Now! Why did you kill him? They kill, and there is no one to make them answer for it. The whole world is watching. It doesn't matter if they kill a child or a woman. There is no one to hold them accountable for it. Therefore, it doesn't matter if they kill a child. Israeli airstrikes have killed at least 26 Palestinians in Gaza, including nine children, as tension escalates dramatically in the region following weeks of protests in Jerusalem. Israeli security forces raided the Al-Aqsa Mosque Monday, injuring hundreds of worshippers. Hamas responded by firing rockets into Israel. We'll go to Gaza and Jerusalem for the latest. Then we look back 36 years ago to the day when a Philadelphia police helicopter dropped a bomb on the home of MOVE, a radical black liberation organization. Let's take a careful look at this 5.27 p.m. State police helicopter drops it. There is the explosion. As you can see, a very dramatic explosion that occurs 30 seconds and really rips into the MOVE compound. The bombing killed 11 people, including five children. But the tra tragedy didn't end on that day. We'll look at how Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania have used bones from one or two of the murdered children in their classes for years. Penn Museum, connected to the University of Pennsylvania, has been holding on to the remains of two children, two black children, for over 36 years. That and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israeli airstrikes have killed at least 26 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, including nine children, as tension in the region has escalated sharply over the past day. In one incident, seven members of a single family in Gaza were killed, including three children. What happened here is we were sitting outside the house waiting for iftar, the breaking of the fast. An eight-month-old child was killed. Muhammad, who was getting married in five days after Eid, was killed. How is this the children's fault? Girls between the ages of seven and nine have been killed. How is this their fault? We are just sitting outside the house waiting for the call to prayer. The attacks came after 700 Palestinians were injured in Jerusalem and the West Bank by Israeli security forces Monday, including a violent crackdown inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the third holiest site in Islam. Hamas responded by firing hundreds of rockets into Israel. No deaths were reported, but police said over two dozen people were injured. The tension in Jerusalem has been mounting for weeks, as Palestinians have been organizing to block Israel from forcibly evicting dozens of Palestinians in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem to give their homes to Jewish settlers. After headlines, we'll go to Gaza and Jerusalem for the latest. India reported another 330,000 coronavirus cases Tuesday and nearly 4,000 additional deaths, though the true tolls are likely far higher. In northern India, dozens of bodies of COVID-19 victims have washed up on the banks of the Ganges River in recent days. Residents said desperate relatives disposed of the bodies in the river after they could not find a cremation site with open space or could not afford to buy wood for a funeral pyre. On Monday, the World Health Organization declared a new, potentially more transmissible coronavirus lineage circulating widely in India is a variant of concern. In the Czech Republic, mourners lit nearly 30,000 candles Monday at Prague Castle to commemorate the number of victims who've fallen to COVID-19. The Czech Republic has the second highest per capita death toll in the world from COVID after Hungary. Worldwide cases have edged down from record highs set in April, but remain at a dangerous high plateau. Case rates are highest in countries with low vaccination rates. In Geneva, World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus called Monday on wealthy nations to stop hoarding vaccine doses at the expense of poorer countries. The shocking global disparity in access to vaccines remains one of the biggest risks to ending the pandemic. High and upper middle income countries represent 53 percent of the world's population, but have received 83 percent of the world's vaccines. By contrast, 
Low and lower middle income countries account for 47% of the world's population, but have received just 17% of the world's vaccines. COVID-19 cases continue to fall across the United States as more of the population is vaccinated. Nearly half of U.S. residents have received at least one vaccine dose. The number testing positive each day has fallen below 40,000 for the first time since September. The Food and Drug Administration, Monday, granted emergency use authorization to Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children as young as 12. This is Acting FDA Commissioner Dr. Janet Woodcock. We know this is a big step for our country. Vaccinating a younger population brings us closer to returning to a sense of normalcy and to ending the pandemic. The Pentagon says a U.S. Coast Guard ship fired warning shots at Iranian speedboats Monday as they approached U.S. Navy ships escorting a nuclear submarine through the Strait of Hormuz. It was the third encounter between U.S. and Iranian ships in the past month. The naval tensions came as dozens of Democratic officials wrote to President Biden asking him to revive the 2015 nuclear agreement with Iran, which former President Trump withdrew from in 2018. The officials demanded the lifting of Trump-era sanctions, writing, quote, the only result has been a vastly expanded Iranian nuclear program, increased regional instability, near U.S.-Iran war on multiple occasions, and severe economic sanctions that have contributed to a dire humanitarian crisis inside Iran, unquote. In Colombia, as massive anti-government protests continue for a second week, the city of Cali has become the epicenter of skyrocketing violence against demonstrators by police and vigilantes. On Sunday, over a dozen protesters were wounded after they were attacked by unknown armed assailants who demanded protesters end the blockade of major highways during a series of indigenous-led actions in Cali. Right-wing President Ivan Duque Monday announced more security forces would be deployed to Cali and urged indigenous leaders to leave the city. This is one of the protesters. President has been making some reforms and changes against the Colombian people, benefiting a few families, big banks, and big international corporations, and placing all the tax burden on the country's poorest population. Nationwide protests started on April 28th against a now-withdrawn tax reform proposed by Duque and have continued to grow amidst increasing poverty, inequity and police brutality in Colombia. This is a member of the National Strike Committee speaking from Bogota Monday. One of the basic guarantees we asked for was respect for the constitutional right to peaceful protest, a simple social right. On the contrary, the discourse of President Ivan Duque was permissive toward the excess of the security forces. In Mexico City, hundreds of mothers whose children have been disappeared led a massive March Monday to commemorate Mother's Day and to urge the government take immediate action against violence and to find missing people. Since the U.S.-backed war on drugs was unleashed in Mexico in 2006, over 85,000 people have disappeared. This is Marisol Esquivel, one of the mothers. The government never told me, Marisol, I am sorry for what happened to you. They have never apologized to us. They are the ones responsible for allowing this situation to continue escalating. The statistics of missing people go up every day. In Guanajuato and Celaya, 531 people disappeared in 2020. In Morocco-occupied Western Sahara, dozens of masked agents broke into the home of the renowned Sahrawi activist Sultana Khaya early Monday morning and detained three well-known human rights defenders. The activists say they were taken to the police station in the city of Bouchdour, tortured for two hours, then driven to a remote location in the desert where they were dumped. The raid follows months of harassment and assaults against Sultana and her family in and around their home, where Sultana has been held under house arrest since November 19th. It's part of a wider Moroccan crackdown on Sahrawi activists this week. This comes after Axios reported Secretary of State Tony Blinken told Morocco's foreign minister during a phone call in late April that the Biden administration would not reverse President Trump's recognition of Morocco's sovereignty over Western Sahara for now, the State Department has not confirmed the report. Morocco has occupied the territory since 1975 in defiance of the United Nations and international law. U.S. recognition came as Morocco agreed to establish diplomatic relations with Israel. To see our documentary, Four Days in Western Sahara, Africa's Last Colony, go to democracynow.org. 
In Italy, more than 2,000 refugees, mostly from sub-Saharan Africa, Pakistan and Syria, have arrived on the Mediterranean island of Lampedusa within the past day. Hundreds of the asylum seekers were forced to sleep on an open-air dock after the local shelter surpassed capacity. Hundreds more have been quarantined until they're tested for COVID-19. This comes as at least five refugees died Sunday after their boat capsized off the Libyan coast as they attempted to reach Europe. A humanitarian aid group said there could be a newborn baby among the dead. In Russia, at least nine people were killed and 13 others hospitalized after a pair of gunmen reportedly opened fire at a school in the city of Kazan. Russian media reported one of the shooters, believed to be a teenager, was arrested by police, while another attacker was shot dead by security forces. School shootings are very rare in Russia. Immediately after Tuesday's assault, President Vladimir Putin said he had ordered Russia's government to immediately begin work on tightening gun ownership regulations. The Washington Post is reporting Trump's Justice Department secretly obtained the phone records and attempted to get email records of journalists reporting on the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. The Justice Department sent three separate letters earlier this month addressed to three Washington Post journalists, notifying them the department had received records associated with their telephone numbers from between April 2017 and June 2017. This comes as press freedom groups are denouncing the Biden administration for defending Trump's move against the Washington Post journalists and the U.S. government's ongoing push to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange from Britain. The head of Instagram has apologized after the social media platform blocked and deleted posts supporting a National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirit two People. A spokesperson from Facebook, which owns Instagram, blamed a global technical issue, but did not provide further details. The company did not specify why the content was singled out. Meanwhile, attorneys general from 44 U.S. states and territories wrote to Facebook Monday urging CEO Mark Zuckerberg to scrap plans to launch a version of Instagram marketed at children younger than 13. The attorneys general wrote, quote, "...use of social media can be detrimental to the health and well-being of children who are not equipped to navigate the challenges of having a social media account," unquote. The Biden administration announced Monday it's reinstating discrimination protections for transgender people accessing health care, reversing an anti-trans Trump-era policy. The move prohibits health care providers that receive federal funding from discriminating against people based on their gender identity or sexual orientation, extending from an anti-discrimination clause that's already included in the Affordable Care Act. California Governor Gavin Newsom has expanded a drought emergency to 39 more counties after the spring snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas measured well below historical averages. Several other western states are also reporting droughts. This follows a record-shattering 2020 fire season along the West Coast, fueled by the climate crisis. In Louisiana, dozens of climate activists with the Sunrise Movement have begun a 400-mile march from New Orleans to Houston, Texas, demanding lawmakers pass a civilian climate corps and provide millions of climate-friendly jobs as part of President Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. And in New York, the federal trial against environmental and human rights lawyer Steve Donziger began Monday. Donziger has been on house arrest for over 600 days and allegations of contempt of court. In 2013, he won a landmark $9.5 billion judgment against oil giant Chevron over the corporation's dumping of 16 billion gallons of oil into the Ecuadorian Amazon. Donziger, who has since been disbarred, says Chevron's legal attacks on him are meant to silence critics and stop other lawsuits against the company for environmental damage. Democracy Now! spoke to Donziger in March. Chevron destroyed the Ecuadorian Amazon, and I was part of a legal team that held the company accountable. The decision in Ecuador has been affirmed by multiple appellate courts in Ecuador and Canada. What Chevron did is, rather than pay the judgment that it owes to the thousands of people in Ecuador that it poisoned. It's gone after me and other lawyers. 
The outlet Common Dreams recently reported Donziger's trial is being overseen by right-wing judge Loretta Preska, a member of the Federalist Society. To see our full interview with Steve Zanziger, go to democracynow.org. And those are the, some of the headlines. This is democracynow.org, the quarantine report. When we come back, Israeli airstrikes have killed at least 26 Palestinians in Gaza, including nine children, as tension escalates dramatically. We'll go to Jerusalem and Gaza. Stay with us. March by Latrio Gibran. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show in Gaza, where Israeli airstrikes have killed at least 26 Palestinians, including nine children, as tension in the region escalates sharply over the past day. In one attack, seven members of a single family in Gaza died, including three children. Meanwhile, over 700 Palestinians were hurt in Jerusalem and the West Bank by Israeli security forces Monday. Hundreds were injured when Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holy a site in Islam. Hamas responded by firing hundreds of rockets into Israel. No deaths were reported, but police said over two dozen people were injured. Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh warned rocket attacks will continue until Israel stops, quote, all scenes of terrorism and aggression in Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa Mosque, unquote. The tension in Jerusalem has been mounting for weeks, as Palestinians have been protesting Israel's plans to forcibly evict dozens of Palestinians in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem to give their homes to Jewish settlers. A court hearing on the eviction, scheduled for Monday, was postponed. The United Nations has described the planned eviction as a possible war crime. In Gaza, families have started to bury the dead after Monday's airstrikes. Survivors describe the airstrikes killing young children. What happened here is we were sitting outside the house waiting for iftar, the breaking of the fast. An eight-month-old child was killed. Muhammad, who was getting married in five days after Eid, was killed. How is this the children's fault? Girls between the ages of seven and nine have been killed. How is this their fault? We are just sitting outside the house waiting for the call to prayer. Israeli Knesset member Ahmad Tibi blamed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for the violent escalation, which comes as Netanyahu who is fighting for his political life. There is escalation. Somebody is responsible for this escalation. His name is Benjamin Netanyahu and Amir Ohanna, Minister of Interior and Security Affairs. They are interested in this escalation by the Israeli police, and we are here as members of the members of the Joint List to stand with the Palestinian families in East Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah, and in Al-Aqsa Mosque. East Jerusalem is an occupied city, and the march today is celebrating the occupation. We're joined now by two guests. 
Orly Noy is in Jerusalem, an Israeli political activist and editor of the Hebrew language news site Local Call, a member of B'Tselem's executive board. And joining us from Gaza City, Raji Sarani, award winning human rights lawyer, director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza. He's the 2013 Right Livelihood Award laureate. He's on the executive board of the International Federation for Human Rights, received the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award in 1991. He was also twice named an Amnesty International Prisoner of Conscience. Um, Raji Sarani, let's go to you first in Gaza. Uh, what the latest numbers we have, 26 people, uh, Palestinians have been killed, among them a number of children. Can you describe the scene on the ground? Thank you, Amy. Um, it's very hard. It's very tough. It's bloody. It's bleak, black uh, situation. Uh, in less than 24 hours, I mean, this harvest of lives and injuries and destruction, uh, it, it's unprecedented. Uh, and, and this reminds us just in what had happened 2014, 2012, and 2008. But this time, I mean, it seems it's much more tougher uh, than it has been before. Uh, Israel, I mean, dominate entirely Gaza, and they are bombing. Uh, they didn't stop uh, since yesterday uh, till this moment. And every moment, I mean, uh, this situation deteriorate more, escalate more, and we are having more killings, more injuries, uh, more civilian targets uh, uh, bombed. Uh, and the die of the storm, unfortunately, as usual, uh, the civilians and the civilian targets. And that's the real worries. As if Gaza just need that. Uh, we have the occupation. Uh, we, we, we have the blockade for the last 14 years, which paralyzed our entire life. Uh, we have the pandemic. Uh, and now, I mean, uh, we are have this fourth war. Uh, against uh, Gaza and civilian, civilian targets in the eye of the storm. Once and again, uh, Israel do flagrantly uh, violate uh, international law, international humanitarian law, uh, which is there to protect civilians at the time of war. They didn't respect that, neither in Gaza, nor in Jerusalem, or in Sheikh Jarrah, or in the, any Palestinian territories. This is a real, a new brand of apartheid, unprecedented, much, much worse than South Africa used to do. And Raji Sarani, I wanted to ask you, what, uh, from your perspective, prompted this latest round of attacks? Uh, clearly, over the last four years during the Trump administration, there was an effort by the United States to sort of further marginalize the Palestinian question and the and the Palestinian uh, the Israeli occupation. Uh, uh, what, in your set, in in your perspective, uh, led to this new round of of attacks by Israel? Well, I mean, uh, this is very right-wing government and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu competing how he can beat the most right extremist, I mean, in Israel. And, and that's what, why he's investing and trying his best to suppress, oppress more and more Palestinians and uh, to, to uh, do what he is doing right now. And uh, uh, Trump administration gave him wonderful gift. They gave him blessing for the settlements policy in the West Bank to, to cement uh, this uh, apartheid regime of Israel in, in Jerusalem and West Bank. They enhanced the ethnic cleansing in, in, in Jerusalem towards Palestinians. And Trump gave his executive order uh, by recognizing Jerusalem as the eternal united capital of, of Israel, unlike any other American administration uh, before. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, Netanyahu felt with that he has absolute and free hand towards that, especially, I mean, he is in the peak of the elections where his position is shaking and he tried to prove more and more that he is real national and he is the one who believe in Eretz Israel. Uh, from the river to the sea, uh, Palestinians with no existence, 
they we don't exist for him uh, that's why uh, he wants to clean i mean jerusalem from uh, palestinians uh, and 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 that's why uh, when gaza stood in solidarity as part of the palestinian people with jerusalem he just jumped to that and he began this orchestrated a campaign of bombing, destruction, and killing once again. And the uh, the evictions that have been uh, uh, that have been proposed in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of East Jerusalem, the United Nations has described the planned evictions as a possible war crime. But uh, and now we have the uh, Israeli Supreme Court postponing at least a decision on it. Could you talk about the importance of this particular neighborhood as? representative of the continuing uh, seizure of land by the Israeli settlers? Well, uh, uh, Israel uh, Judaized Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, uh, they ethnically cleansing, I mean, the Palestinians from there. They are taking it over day after day. Uh, uh, by forcing people to leave, by imposing pressure, by expulsion, by building this uh, uh, apartheid wall, uh, uh, the, 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 the most important court on earth said it's null and void and should be abolished. Uh, Sheikh Jarrah is a good example, I mean, for that. They want to take it over. It's, it's stones, it's sands, it's trees. Uh, Palestinian genuine part of, of Jerusalem, and the people in it, I mean, uh, they were refugees. I mean, they came in 1948 uh, to this after Israel forced them to leave, uh, after the atrocities they, 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 they made against them. And, and they came to, to this part, and they settled, and they are existing there. They don't want them to exist uh, there. Uh, Israel, uh, and I want to remind everybody that entire East Jerusalem and occupied territories. Uh, this is not by Palestinian. It's it's by Palestinians, by by UN, and the whole world, uh, uh, including uh, the American administration, used to uh, call it as such till Trump administration. Now, with with what they are doing, they want to force people to leave using the name of the High Court. What is the high court in Israel? The high court in Israel and the courts in Israel regarding Palestinians. They are racist, they are schizophrenic, and they are there to provide full legal cover for organized systematic crimes perpetrated against the Palestinian people. They're just giving, I mean, this legal cover for uh, what is right. They don't apply international law. They don't apply international material law. Uh, uh, for them, this is with non-existence. But they recognize one thing only. They recognize the right of the Israeli Jews, those who considered uh, uh, holy blood, holy soils, holy uh, land, others. I mean, we are with non-existence. I want to go to that video that has gone viral on social media of the Sheikh Jarrah resident, Muna al Kurd, confronting an Israeli settler who'd been living in her family's home for 12 years. <laughs> Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you It's you're... easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, ya ammi. We spoke to Mona al Kurd's twin brother, Mohammed al Kurd, uh, yesterday. Um, they are resisting the um, uh, forcing out of the Palestinians from Sheikh Shorah. I wanted to bring Orly Noy into the conversation. The Israeli political activist, editor of the Hebrew language news site Local Call, member of the B'Tselem executive board. You are in Jerusalem. Explain what is happening there and the escalation, uh, the way the U.S. media following um, the Israeli government media often refers to this is Hamas is shooting rockets into Israel. Give us the context before this happened. Yeah, well, uh, it, we should 
I will get in a minute to the context of this last round of escalation. But before doing that, we need to look at the broader context of uh, the, the uh, inherent and institutionalized uh, violence against the Palestinians, which is a constant, there is a constant war at different levels that Israel is embarking upon against the Palestinian uh, residents of Jerusalem. First, we need to remember that uh, uh, the Palestinians in Jerusalem, which make about 40 percent of the city's population, are not citizens of Israel. And uh, they are, uh, as far as Israel is concerned, a sort of temporary residents of the city. It means that their houses are constantly under the threat of uh, demolition, uh, they, they, being taken over by uh, settlers. It means that they are basically subjected to a different set of law. And this is part of the apartheid nature of uh, the Palestinian reality everywhere and in Jerusalem. So this is the broader context. The latest round of escalation actually started with the very arbitrary and outrageous decision by the Jerusalem police to ban the Palestinians from gathering at the end of the fast uh, during Ramadan uh, on the wide uh, steps outside Damascus Gate, which is one of the main gathering centers of Palestinians in East Jerusalem, certainly in the month of Ramadan, uh, which, you know, should be uh, fest those festive, uh, festive evenings after the breaking of the fast, which always uh, uh, happened uh, in Damascus Gate. Uh, so, and, and I think that the police knew very well that this will not go on protest, uh, without protest. And, and surely, uh, the Pal surely enough, the Palestinians uh, did protest, which only gave the uh, Jerusalem police uh, an excuse to treat them with extreme brutality. And I was there night after night. The amount, I cannot even begin to describe what war zone, an actual war zone, the police created because of the protest, because of Palestinians protesting against this arbitrary, senseless, uh, provocative decision. Uh, and of course, when you add to that the, the threat of the evictions in Sheikh Jarrah, which, by the way, are not for the first time, Palestinians have been constantly being evicted from uh, not only Sheikh Jarrah, but also from Silwan and from other sensitive areas in the historic holy basin of the old city uh, for, and from the Muslim quarter of the old city uh, itself. So all of that sort of, uh, uh, as was very much expected from the first moment, exploded into the uh, situation that we are witnessing right now. And Orly Noy, could you talk about the uh, how uh, Netanyahu is uh, hoping to benefit from this instability and the pro the, his own problems that he is facing in terms of being able to form a, a new government and the repeated uh, elections in Israel, how this plays into his political interests? Yes, after Netanyahu exhausted the time that was given to him to try and establish a, 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 a government and failed to do so, his main goal became to prevent his ri political rivals from uh, uh, succeeding in forming a new government. Now, it, the Israeli politics is now in a very strange phase in which r extreme right-wingers are controlling both sides of the Israeli map, which is the pro-Netanyahu uh, camp and the anti-Netanyahu camp. Also in the anti, but the, the situation in the anti-Netanyahu camp, which now has the mandate to try and step and, and, and form a government, uh, is such that it, it needs the, uh, for uh, uh, extreme right-wingers like Naftali Bennett and Gidon Saar, uh, to collaborate in some way with left, central left parties such as Labour Party, Merits, 
and with the silent collaboration uh, or cooperation of the joint list. Uh, the sure way for Netanyahu to prevent that cooperation between both uh, political sides in the anti-Netanyahu camp is to provoke them this, the, the situation, the reality, into a war, which, uh, uh, in which case uh, it would be much more difficult because the, the uh, Bennett people, the right-wing people, uh, Saar, Bennett, etc., uh, they need to be accountable to their uh, uh, basic uh, uh, basis of uh, voters. Uh, they want to escalate the situation. They want uh, stronger attacks on Gaza, uh, uh, more violence against Palestinians, both inside and outside uh, 48 territories, uh, which is something, of course, that would make the, the co cooperation with the left, central left uh, side of the uh, political map almost I impossible to achieve. And at the same time, uh, the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is on trial for corruption. As we wrap up, Raji Sarani, we just got word from Haaretz that it looks like two Israelis were just killed in Ashkelon. That's where the Hamas rockets are falling. Um, and you have the 26 Palestinians, a number of them children, um, in Gaza as a result of the Israeli attacks. Uh, and, finally, uh, the response of the United States. Secretary of State Tony Blinken said Hamas needs to end the rocket attacks immediately and added all sides need to de-escalate. What do you think has to happen now? And, specifically, what are you demanding of the U.S. government? To have an end for this bloody, prolonged military occupation, that's the issue. I mean, we cannot live with that. We we cannot allow this to happen. I, I mean, I I cannot understand or digest how international community seeing these war crimes, the crimes against humanity, happening once and again, once and again. Uh, all international human rights organizations know and realize what's going on. This is a new brand of apartheid. There is need to have an end for this conflict. It's a time, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to have something, something simple apply in this part of the world. Rule of law, make accountability, all what we need, peace. No one on earth in need for peace more than the suppressed and the oppressed. We suffered a lot as a Palestinian people but we still having strong feeling toward justice. Uh, we want uh, peace based on international law, international humanitarian law. What we need, simple thing, end of the occupation. What we need, end of this aggression. Israel should be held accountable, and U.S. can deliver. It's enough what the American administration did for Israel, providing them full political immunity against the crimes they are doing once and again against Palestinians. ICC, as well, will be one of the places where these Israeli war criminals will be held against all the crimes they committed against the Palestinian civilians in the occupied territories, against the ethnic cleansing, against the settlements policy, against the atrocities. I mean, they are making day and night. Raji Zarani, I want to thank you very much for being with us, a human rights lawyer, director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza, please be safe, and Orly Noy, Israeli political activist, editor of the Hebrew language news site Local Call, also a member of the human rights group Betzalem's uh, executive board. When we come back, we look back 36 years ago this week, to the day when a Philadelphia police helicopter dropped a bomb on the home of MOVE, a radical black liberation organization, killing 11 people, including five children. But the tragedy didn't end on that day. We'll look at how Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania have used bones from one or two of the murdered children in their classes for years. Stay with us.
told my mama she was priceless. She told me she wanted a good life. I told her mama I'ma give you that. She said she wanna live her best life, no strife. I said yo mama you deserve it all. She said she really didn't want much. I asked her what you want for me to do. She said you gave me what I want because I'm home with you. Hey. by Mike Africa Jr. featuring Suzanne Christine. He says that when his mother came home from prison after 40 years, she told him to be free and fly, baby. Debbie Africa and Michael Africa Sr. are in that video as well. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, with Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. By the way, you can sign up for our daily news digest by sending the word Democracy Now!, one word, no space, texting it to 66866. Text Democracy Now! to 66866. We spend the rest of the hour and a story Democracy Now! has been following for decades, and again more intensively this past month, as Philadelphia's racist past resurfaced with the public disclosure that the bones of one or two African-American children killed by the city's police in 1985 are being used in an online Princeton University course called Real Bones, Adventures in Forensic Anthropology. These bones are being used without the knowledge of their families. This Thursday, May 13th, marks the 36th anniversary of the day the city of Philadelphia bombed its own citizens. On that day, in 1985, police surrounded the home of MOVE, a radical black liberation organization that was defying orders to vacate. Police flooded the home with water, filled the house with tear gas, blasted the house with automatic weapons, all failing to dislodge the residents. Finally, police dropped a bomb on the house from a helicopter, killing 11 people, six adults and five children. The fire burned an entire city block to the ground, destroying over 60 homes. This is how the bombing was initially reported in Philadelphia, on WCAU-TV. I've just been advised that we have new videotape of uh, the episode that apparently ended, we think ended, the uh, move situation tonight, the dropping of an incendiary device. And let's take a careful look at this. 5.27 p.m., state police helicopter drops it. There is the explosion. As you can see, a very dramatic explosion that occurs 30 seconds and really rips into the move compound. There you see the bunker, which soon will go up in flames. And that was the explosion close up. Now, if there's anybody there, standing there, it's obvious they couldn't survive that explosion. So that was May 13, 1985. The police bombing came after an earlier standoff with MOVE in 1978 ended in a hail of police gunfire, leaving one police officer dead. MOVE members say they didn't fire a shot and that the officer, um, that the victim, the officer was a victim of friendly fire. Former mayor of Philadelphia, Wilson Good, concurred with that conclusion. Nevertheless, nine of them were convicted of his murder and given life sentences. One of them, Debbie Africa, secretly gave birth in her cell just five weeks into her sentence. She managed to keep her son, Mike Africa Jr., with her for three days before alerting the guards. Seven of the move nine are now free. 
um, after serving 40 years. Two died in prison. In a minute, we'll be joined by Mike Africa, Jr. Last month, Philadelphia activist and writer Abdul Ali Muhammad learned the bones from one or two of the children killed by the police in that 1985 moon bombing, Trey and Delisha Africa, were being used by Princeton University and the University of Pennsylvania's Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in an online video course. In the video, Penn Museum curator Janet Monge handles the bones and calls them, quote, juicy, meaning that you can tell that they're a, of a recently deceased individual, she said. This comes as press accounts from 1985 say that Tree's remains, she was 14, were buried along with those of her half-sister Zanetta not long after the conclusion of an official inquiry. The remains of the other children, including Delisha, were reportedly handed over to a state senator who ran a funeral home and had them buried in unmarked graves. But if the bones of Tree and Delisha were buried in 1985, how did they end up in Janet Monge's hands 36 years later? Well, for more on these developments and what the children's families are calling for, we're going to Philadelphia to speak with Abdul Ali Muhammad, who helped reveal how the remains were being used after they first called for the Penn Museum to repatriate the skulls of enslaved people held in its Morton collection. Also joining us, Mike Africa, Jr., host of the podcast On a Move with Mike Africa, Jr., and co-author of the new book, 50 Years on a Move. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Abdul Ali Muhammad, let's begin with you. I mean, your reporting on what has happened to these bones in the Philadelphia Inquirer and other places is key to understanding what's taken place. How is it possible that Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania have been using these bones to educate students about, um, what, adventures in anthropology? I mean, it, it's 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 gross. Um, it, you ask, how is it possible? Uh, I, we still don't know um, all the details about what happened um, in terms of the chain of custody of the the bodily remains of Tree and Delisha Africa. Um, what we know, <clears throat> according to archival research uh, and the work that I have been doing, is that. Uh, in the days after the bombing, the days after the state murder of 11 people, 11 black people in Philadelphia, uh, Alan Mann, who was a professor at Penn, who is a bioanthropologist, was hired by the medical examiner's office to help in uh, determining who the remains belonged to. Because like you said earlier in this um, segment, that the the bomb then burned and uh, causing a destruction of uh, two city blocks, the killing of eleven people. Um, the city, in its efforts to get the remains from the crime scene in the days following, basically used machinery and mangled bodies um, instead of carefully um, gathering the remains of people. And so the medical examiner needed help in figuring out who these remains belonged to. Alan Mann was hired by the medical examiner's office to work for a day and some change to help identify remains. And Janet Monge was a PhD student at the time and so assisted Mann in helping identify remains. Their conclusion was that there were um, seven adults and four, ch four children, uh, which we now know is inaccurate. Uh, you know, months later, Mayor Good, Mayor Wilson Good, creates the MOVE Commission to look into what the events and the bombing. The MOVE Commission hires a forensic specialist named Dr. Ali Hameli from Delaware. Dr. Ali Hameli examines the remains and concludes in a report uh, that there are the remains of six adults and five children. And we know from archival, in, from our archival you know, information and documentation that Hameli has to re-examine the remains because man challenges the findings in the press. So now Hameli re-examines the remains in November of 1985 with two other people and reaffirms his earlier report, which is that 
you know, these remains are of five children and six adults. And the the remains that were said to have been unidentifiable belong to Tree Africa. And there were some other remains um, that there were, there were questions about. Um, and Hameli says these remains belong to Delicia Africa. Uh, what the commission does after that is send a memorandum to the medical examiner's office to release the remains per the normal procedures of that office. So we are... I'm just I'm just mind blown at the fact that 36 years later, these remains pop up on a video to teach about anthropology. Well, uh, Abdul Ali Mohammed, I wanted to ask you in terms of the uh, of the uh, of this Morton collection itself and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Morton was celebrated as a founder of American ethnography, but he was actually a white supremacist. Uh, could you talk about this whole issue, this scandal of these institutions continuing to hold uh, the bones, many of them of uh, enslaved Africans and of Native Americans as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, like you said, Morton was a white supremacist physician um, who amassed a collection of skulls um, in the late 1700s and 1800s. And Morton's, uh, you know, research or race science uh, was based on this notion that uh, humans had different ancestors, right? That race, different races had different ancestors. Um, and he tried to posit the idea that you could tell the intellectual capacity of a race by measuring skulls. And so to do his scientific work, he w would purchase skulls from plantations. Um, there are skulls that were grave robbed by uh, from a local potter's field in Philadelphia of 14 uh, black Philadelphians, um, their remains were stolen. Um, and this collection, like you said, has indigenous folks, has um, poor white people. And uh, his science was basically trying to legitimize the institution of slavery by stating that, you know, black folks uh, and, and other people, like indigenous people, had less uh, capacity for intellectual, uh, you know, thought than, than white people. Um, and so about two years ago, I started calling for the repatriation of the remains uh, housed in the Morton collection. And that escalated. And then around the uprising, Police Free Pen formed calling again for repatriation for the abolition of policing on campus. And in that context, they restated my demand for repatriation. Penn then creates a committee to consider the question of repatriation and reburial. Um, and there, were, there was more momentum around this conversation. Uh, then almost a year later, Paul Wolf Mitchell, a PhD student, then identifies, oh, they don't just have the, the, the 53 crania that we originally thought they had, right? 51 crania from a, um, a plantation in Cuba, um, in Vedado, um, and then two from black folks in the U.S. They additionally have 14 crania of black Philadelphians grave robbed from uh, Franklin Field, which is a part of Penn's campus. It's an athletic field that used to be a burial site. Um, and so when that happened, it reignited the call for a repatriation. There was a protest and there were, um, you know, demands stated at that protest to repatriate the remains or if they can't be repatriated, to give them to descendant communities uh, to to bury them. And after that happened, that's when this, the, the story came to me about uh, Penn's possession, Penn Museum's possession of Tree and Delicia's remains. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Mike Africa, Jr., to the conversation. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, how are the families uh, and the MOVE community processing and responding to these latest developments on what happened with the remains of two of the children in the bombing? It's, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show um, to, to put out this information. It, the people in our family, are, as you can imagine, are, are still very shaken up and disturbed and <clears throat> traumatized, re-traumatized. You know, we, we were supposed to do this thing 
um, this year because of uh, the city council, um, since city councilwoman Jamie Gaultier pushed for an, an apology from the city, uh, city council and, and the city of Philadelphia for dropping the bomb. And there was this like possibility, possible opportunity to like really start talking about how uh, we can reconnect and recommit and reobserve and all of these things for what happened on May 13th, 1985. And although we never um, we never forget about what happened, you know, just going back to that day to try to to, to try to uh, you know learn from it so that it never happens again, you know, it's it's like one of these things where you can't even begin to heal because the harm is still being done. And so, like, everybody is just re-traumatized and have to relive May 13th all over again. And to find out that this happened to two of the children, you know, it's, it's, it's devastating. You know, it gives me the creeps just listening to the reports about what happened to our sisters. Everybody in the family are just, <sighs> just stuck right now. In fact, Mike— you knew Tree. You knew Delisha. You um, lived and played with them uh, on a farm in Virginia. Yeah, I did. Um, we lived for years. We for years together. See, the thing is, we were all like unconventional orphans, right? All of our our, our parents were in prison, and so we were always together because the people, the other people, the caretakers of the organization, they took us in because, like, my parents were in prison, just like Trees mother was and just like uh, Delisha's parents were, you know. So, yeah, we all we were always together. We were always doing everything together, eating together. We played together. We cried together. We were in fear together, you know. Um, to, to hear about this, it's, it's, it's devastating. It's... And, uh, Mike, in your book uh, that uh, uh, that you uh, that you've written uh, 50 years on a move, you um, you talk about the history of the relations between move and the political establishment uh, and the police department and uh, in Philadelphia. And as you know, I was a young reporter back then in Philadelphia at the time. I I, I lived through the 78 uh, uh, confrontation and the killing of Officer Ramp, which obviously was uh, was from was from police fire, not from the not from the move compound then, and then of course the 1985 bombing as well. Uh, could you talk about the 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 situation back then, especially under uh, uh, Mayor uh, Rizzo, Frank Rizzo? Uh, I recall after the 78 uh, uh, shootout when. Um, uh, when Delbert Africa was publicly beaten in the streets, almost senseless by a, a group of police officers, that the the head of the NAACP at the time, Alfonso Deal, who later became a uh, a, a state uh, a representative, said at that time he publicly called for an investigation of police abuse. And Mayor Rizzo went on the six o'clock news and said, "As for Al Deal, I want a piece of him myself." That was a kind of mayor that Frank Rizzo was back then. And could you talk about the climate that, uh, uh, what, and how MOVE became a lightning rod of police abuse in those days? You know, much, much like the Black Panthers and other organizations that wanted to see change, that's what MOVE was doing. That's what John Africa was about, trying to make some kind of change because of the conditions of, uh, of the cis, uh, of, of Black people's living and and not just black people, but poor whites and animals and the environment. It, you know, every, we need a change. And that message was so, like, strong. And when you try to make change, when you try to do something to, to, to upset the current establishment and, and try to just take us in a new direction because these, what's happening is wrong, they, they don't want these, these things to change. They want to stay in this position, in this position of power, in this position of control. And so when, when anybody try to speak up, it ain't just move that, that will run into these obstacles and, these, and, and this wall of police and this wall of, of politicians and just trying to stop you from, from, from putting out this information. And so um, that's exactly what move, Rizzo was like Donald Trump, you know, of that time, except he was even worse 
in, the, in, the, in that confined space. Mike Africa Jr., we have to leave it there. I know your family will be doing something on Thursday on the anniversary of the um, 36 years ago, uh, the police killing That's right. uh, 11 people in the Mu family. Uh, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez, Mike Africa, and uh, Abdul Ali Mohammed. Thank you.